Thank you so much, everybody, for being here today. Um, as you can see, we will be talking about the intersection of uh, energy codes and electrical codes on the road to decarbonization. Um, this is part of the Department of Energy's uh, Building Energy Codes program webinar series. So this is a monthly um, series that happens on every Thursday, uh, third Thursday of the month. So this is our, our latest webinar installment of that. And we thank you so much for joining us today. Um, as you have probably already seen, this webinar is being recorded. Um, so we will have a video available of the recording on the website um, sometime next week. I will be emailing everybody out um, and letting you know when that recording is available. Um, I'll also put this link in the chat here. This is the uh, link where the recording will be, and it is currently where you can find the PDF of the full presentation that we'll be using today. So if you would like to go there, um, you can follow along, you can download uh, the presentation. We'll also obviously be going through it here as well. Um, and uh, we ask that you add all of your questions in the Q&A um, function. So there should be a, a feature on your screen. Instead of using the chat as much as possible, we'd ask you to just use the, the Q&A so that we can keep track of all the questions. Uh, make sure that we answer those at the end of the webinar where we will be doing a Q&A with all of your questions and our wonderful speakers. Um, and finally, we are offering um, CEUs for the session. So you can either request a certificate that you can use to self-report or um, you know, other organizations for the time, or we can um, give you AIA LUs and we can submit your AIA number. So at the end of the session, um, I'll be posting a link in the chat. So if you would just go to that link, fill out your name, all your info, let us know whether you want AIA or a certificate or both, and I'll send that stuff out to you as well next week um, or as, as soon as I can. So make sure to stay until the end because that's when we'll be posting uh, the link in the chat to get the CEUs. And like I said, this is part of a webinar series. Um, we are taking a little break in May and June, so we don't have any more webinars in the next few months. We'll be back in July, but um, this is a list of all the previous webinars that we've had. They're all available on that website linked there. Um, that I can also throw in the chat as well. Um, you can find the presentations and recordings for every single one on our website. Um, so let's get to the good stuff. Um, we have a few speakers here today talking on these topics. We'll start off with um, Chris Perry with the United States Department of Energy. Um, then Amy Lewis, Associate Director of Codes and Policy at New Buildings Institute, will, will take us uh, next. And then Brennan Les with um, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab will close this out, and then we'll have a, a Q&A with all the speakers. And we'll start off with Chris, if you want to take it away from here. Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you, Corey. Um, I'll note before I get started, I actually just got a notification that my internet connection is a little unstable. So if I cut off, you know, for any amount of time, just let me know and I will go back and repeat what I was just saying. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and get started here. So um, as a brief introduction, I'm an engineer with the Building Energy Codes Program here at DOE in the Building Technologies Office. Um, I've been with DOE about two and a half years and um, I will be moderating this session, but I also wanted to start here with a, a few slides at the beginning. Um, my goal is really just to tee up this conversation and set the stage for, for the discussion um, and talk about how we as DOE see um, the grid changing and how that you know, impacts energy codes and the electrical code. Um, I'll do some of this through the lens of our connected communities work. Um, and then, you know, I will end talking about, uh, you know, the work that I do day to day, um, you know, on, with our energy codes program. So uh, next slide, Corey, please. So this is uh, just real quick who we are slide. Um, we are the building energy codes program. Uh, we support energy code development, adoption, implementation, and enforcement processes. And so the way that we go about this, um, we participate in industry processes for model energy codes. And so this is a lot of what I do with my time is, is working in ASHRAE 90.1 and IECC code development committees. Um, we issue determinations whenever a new code uh, is published that says 
whether that code saves energy over the previous version of the code. And then we provide um, technical assistance to states uh, um, to help implement their, their energy codes. And we have um, money through Bill and IRA that is helping us uh, ramp that effort up. And I, I will talk about that at the end of my, my presentation here. Um, and just, I will note, you know, um, our focus is really on energy codes. And so I, I personally don't deal with electrical codes very often, although it, it comes up in conversation quite a bit. Um, and so I'm excited that we have a session where we can talk about both, about energy um, and uh, the National Electric Code, the NEC. Um, next slide, Corey, please. So um, next few slides are on our connected communities work, which uh, we thought tied nicely in with this presentation. So, um, you know, as DOE, we we see uh, the electricity grid changing pretty rapidly um, and for a few different reasons. So we're seeing this uh, urgency to decarbonize um, and, and use cleaner sources of energy in the grid. Um, we're, we're seeing, um, you know, variable energy resources and, and efficiency and, you know, renewable energy resources uh, uh, entering the grid at, at um, you know, rates that uh, that are much higher than, than you know, in, in past years and past decades. Um, there's increasing electrification of vehicles and buildings. Uh, you know, we're seeing EVs, uh, EV adoption throughout the country take off, um, heat pumps, heat pump water heaters, technologies like those. Uh, there's this need to modernize the uh, electricity infrastructure. And so that's, you know, for instance, taking a look at what our traditional grid system is, uh, you know, and adding in microgrid systems where, you know, can help improve the resilience, um, you know, in, in a certain area. And then there's a need to decarbonize buildings um, you know, and save consumers money on their energy bills. And that's a lot of what we do in the Building Energy Builds program. And so a lot of what um, our connected communities uh, work is a DOE. We we help enable a lot of this through um, through demonstration projects. Uh, next slide. And this is um, you know our vision of what an integrated energy system would look like. So you still have you know the traditional grid, which is over there on the left. But in this scenario, it's low emissions. Uh, you know, primarily using renewable energy generation, um, probably some storage in there, uh, and then you have connected communities. And so um, these connected communities are, uh, they contain a mix of energy uses. And so it's like energy um, energy users that, that are highly energy efficient, uh, energy generation, you know, again, a lot of renewable energy, um, and then grid flexible and smart technologies um, that can help interact with the grid and help shed and shift and manage um, load on the grid. Uh, next, next slide. And this is just a little bit about um, our Connected Communities cohort. Um, so we funded 10 projects at $61 million total. Those final awards were made in March of 2023. Um, and it's a nice mix of residential and multifamily and commercial um, buildings in both new construction and retrofit projects. Uh, and there's um, a diverse range of um, technologies and, uh, and approaches in these projects, um, you know, that include distributed energy resources, demand flexibility, um, energy efficiency. And um, just want to read one sentence from the Connected Communities website. Uh, so these communities interact with their electrical grid to optimize their energy consumption, which will reduce their carbon emissions and cut energy costs. Um, so that's really the goal of these projects. I mean, we're, we're very excited about them. So next slide, um, Corey, I want to tie this. So that was the high level, um, you know, how we're looking at the grid and how, how we see changes on the grid, um, you know, occurring uh, in real time. And so now let's bring it down to what we're going to be talking about today, which is codes. Um, and so uh, today we're going to be looking at both energy codes. So um, ASHRAE 90.1 and IECC, as well as um, the electrical code, the NEC, um, National Electrical Code. And so um, I think it's worth noting that, that you know, these, these two are, are uh, highly impacted by, you know, the changing grid and electrification and decarbonization, but other codes are as well. And we're not going to be talking about them here, but, um, you know, maybe in a future date, we can, you know, have a, a webinar on that. But Mechanical code, plumbing are good examples um, for heat pumps and heat pump water heaters, respectively. Um, next slide. And so um, this is, uh, we wanted to show this graphic to show, um, 
you know, one of one of the many things that we're working on in the Building Energy Codes program. So uh, one of uh, the things that we are um, we've been working on with states and jurisdictions and model energy codes is is understanding how to get to zero energy or zero emissions. And so um, this graphic shows uh, what we've done to help um, work with the ASHRAE 90.1 committee, which is uh, wanted to understand what it would take to get to zero um, energy by the 2031 code. And so you'll note in um, green, uh, the green dotted line represents increasing energy efficiency. So still driving down the energy consumption within a building. And then the orange on the bottom is um, renewable energy requirements. And so offsetting that energy use in the building with renewable energy requirements. And what's not shown on this graphic is another um, really important consideration, which is the, the building's ability to interact with the grid um, and help reduce strain from you know, new uh, electrical loads being added to the grid, and then that variable variable um, uh, generation technology like you know, solar PV on, on rooftops. Next slide. So something that we offer in the next few slides are, are uh, things that our program offers. Um, we uh, have stretch code language um, that can be overlaid onto energy codes for states and jurisdictions that are interested in, in adding it. So, you know, it, the state or jurisdiction wants um, language around EV charging or solar um, photovoltaic requirements uh, or electric readiness um, and demand response. Uh, we we have some of that on our, our stretch codes webpage. I encourage you to check it out. Um, some, some of these uh, um, different strategies and, and technologies and approaches are also starting to appear in the model energy codes too, ASHRAE 90.1 and IECC, um, some of them in the body of the code, some of them in, you know, optional appendices, but uh, we're, we're starting to see a lot more interest in these from um, a variety of, of stakeholders, you know, including these types of technologies in the codes. Um, and so we, we are helping, um, you know, in, enable that. Uh, next slide. And the next two slides here are just some of the tracking that we do. So we we are trying to, um, you know, as DOE stay on top of and understand and then make available this information for everybody of what states and jurisdictions are adopting different um, types of uh, requirements. And so um, for this, this map, it shows um, states and jurisdictions that are, are uh, that have adopted um, solar and electric vehicle um, requirements. And then the, the map on the next slide um, shows a stretch code adoption in states and jurisdictions. Um, and the, the little pie charts show um, adoption, um, like proportional adoption in, in jurisdictions. And so if you're interested in, in this, and you know we have a lot of other resources too, uh, I encourage you to check out our infographics webpage, which is uh, again down, down there at the bottom. Um, a lot of really good resources on there. And then next slide. I think this is my final slide, but I thought it would be a good one to end on. So we we do have as a program over um, or, or as DOE uh, really when it comes to energy codes, over one point two billion dollars um, to support adoption and implementation of energy codes, and that's a lot of um, uh, really relevant activities like com compliance improvement, workforce education, uh, improving equity and and partnerships and collaboratives, um, and in innovative approaches, and so. Through the bipartisan infrastructure law, we have two hundred twenty-five million dollars, um, and then through the Inflation Reduction Act, there is one billion dollars, and um, it's especially relevant for this conversation. So I do want to point out that two-thirds of the money from the IRA codes funding uh, is will go towards zero energy um, codes, and so that's that's highly relevant to this conversation today. You know, as, as we're talking about that drive towards decarbonization. Um, and we announced our, our initial awards. Um, this is from from the bill from the two hundred twenty five million. We announced the the um, first portion of those awards in July of this past year. Uh, we awarded twenty seven different projects uh, across twenty six states um, in also Washington D.C. And uh, we variety of states, variety of projects. Uh, we're really excited about all of them. Most of them are are have you know, gotten off the ground already or, you know, are in the process of starting um, and we're working with all those project teams and uh, we're really excited about those. And then, you know, the future ones that we, we, we're, we you know, planning to announce here um, in the future once they are. Ready. So, um, and I, I think that's it for me, um, just as a preview. So we'll, we'll have 
Amy Lewis at NBI talking about um, permitting in inspection guides for electric vehicle supply equipment and solar energy storage systems. After Amy, we have Brennan Bless at LBNL talking about the National Electric Code um, and explaining differences between energy efficiency and power efficiency, things like that. So we're going to have a really good um, uh, lineup for you today. So with that, I'll turn it over to Amy. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Chris and Corey, for the introduction. As mentioned, I'm Amy Lewis in Codes and Policy at NBI. Today, I'm here to share with you about a set of solutions that we helped develop, permitting and inspection guidelines for EVSC and solar and storage installation. Next slide. Here's what I'll cover um, a little bit about NBI, about the, um, the pilot program and partners where, in which the guides were developed, an overview of the guides, how to use them, uh, and what's in them, best practices and lessons learned, where to find them. And um, actually, we will hold the Q&A for the end. But uh, before I wrap up, um, I will mention some related educational resources from other partners um, and, and mention a quick uh, look ahead to um, how it relates to advances in energy codes. The New Buildings Institute is a nonprofit with a mission to push for better buildings that achieve zero energy, zero carbon, and beyond through research, policy, guidance, and market transformation to protect people and the planet. We follow five foundations for carb carbon neutral buildings, energy efficiency, renewable energy, grid integration and storage, building electrification, and embodied carbon. This program, of course, falls within our focus areas. What I found personally exciting about this program um, was the opportunity to de develop resources that can be used uh, useful to any number of jurisdictions and um, to help think about how they can be implemented most effectively. Next slide. Um, this, again, I've, I've introduced myself, but I, in fairness, I wanted to mention that I actually joined NBI close to the end of this, uh, this wonderful three-year project. And I wanted to mention a couple of people who were involved from NBI before me. Uh, Kevin Berry, project anal analyst in codes and policy, helped wrap up the pilot program over the last six months. And before that, Diana Burke was project manager and did a fantastic job overseeing the project. Next slide. This was a three-year project funded by DOE to help streamline the permitting and inspection process for distributed energy resources. These resources include electric vehicle supply equipment and solar and energy storage. We believe that streamlining the permitting and inspection process with clear guidance on code requirements for these technologies will both make our communities safer and can help speed up the adoption of these technologies by lowering soft costs. Fourth and Earth Advantage helped develop the permitting and inspection guides. SWEEP, based in the Southwest, and the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, based in Boston, supported in deploying the guides in several jurisdictions in their regions for the pilot. SoulSmart also consulted on the development of the solar and storage guides, and South Face is one of our partners in promoting educational solutions. ICC helped publicize the guides, as well as providing technical review. IREC has supported coordination of empowered programs and dissemination of trainings and solutions. Next slide. In the first phase of the program, the guides were developed in a process that included a review and comparison of a variety of existing permitting and inspection processes. The guides were designed to address barriers and misunderstandings that were identified in interviews and surveys with practitioners. In the pilot program, the guides were reviewed and tested out in a number of jurisdictions. Feedback from the pilot participants was incorporated into the final guides. Next slide. The pilot program included four jurisdictions in two regions, Arizona and Massachusetts, as listed here. Um, I'm sorry, that's going off the screen. Um, I want to be able to mention those. I'm just grabbing it. Oh, I'm sorry, that's uh, that's actually the end of the list. I thought it was going off the screen, my apologies. 
Um, so you can go back to that slide for a moment. I wanted to take a moment to appreciate the jurisdictions that participated. The building, uh, we know building departments are notoriously busy and these thoughtful and committed members of your communities took the time to really contribute to the outcome of this program. So thanks to the participants. Next slide. Here is a list of many, but not all of the groups that provided technical peer review. After all of the jurisdictional feedback and technical peer review was collected, it was compiled by us at NBI and underwent a round of internal technical review um, as well. Next slide. Before we dive in, who were the guides for? The guides are primarily for building departments that are considering implementing a new process, uh, permitting an inspection process or improving their existing process. They're also very useful references for designers, builders, and installing contractors who want to know what the requirements are for compliance in your jurisdictions, as well as homeowners and property managers. Next slide. This is a look at the guides. Um, before we go any further, it would be nice to drop a link in the chat so you know where to find them um, on the NBI website. I think that Corey can help out with that. Um, and otherwise I will would drop it in the chat when I have a chance. So these are guides for EVSE and solar and energy storage. Each has a version for single family and duplex and one for multifamily and commercial buildings. If you're wondering which codes are referenced in the guides, I think that's in the next, the next set of slides. Next slide. So the, um, the EVSC guides cover level two EVSC or 120 and, and 240 volts and references the 2020 um, NEC. We also have, um, we produced a set of these guides referencing the 2020 NEC and um, and associated uh, cycles of building codes, um, and a set in 2017 NEC because um, there's a number of states and jurisdictions still on 2017 NEC. Next slide. I think rather than reading out all of the codes, I'll just show it for a few moments. Um, and then you can flip to the next slide, please. And one more, yes, thank you. Okay, next slide. The guides include permit submission requirements, a detailed general installation guide, plan review and field inspection checklists, additional resources, a sample permit application and electrical line diagrams for solar and storage. Next slide. Note there are a few things that are not included in the guides. If the required load calculation demonstrates a service upgrade is needed, this streamlining permitting and inspection guide cannot be used to determine code compliance of the service upgrade. Next slide. Um, this is a, a screenshot of the permit submission requirements. This is a short list of minimum requirements to submit showing compliance with the code requirements from uh, samples from a couple of the guides. Next slide. Here's a view of what the general installation guide pages look like. Um, the one on the left is from EVSE and the one on the right is from energy, one of the energy storage guides. For each technology, we've broken up the checklist items into different sections. For EVSC, the first section covers requirements specific to the charging equipment itself, such as the NRTL certification and whether the enclosure type is rated for indoor or outdoor use. The multifamily and office EVSC guides guide includes requirements for public parking spaces, like the percent of spaces with EVSC that have to be accessible and the dimensions of those spaces. The location height of EVSC or energy storage equipment and vehicle impact protection requirements are included in the next section. 
The guides provide the electrical requirements such as load calculations, overcurrent protection size rating, wire gauge, outlet requirements, and for multifamily and office, automatic load management system requirements. Next slide. Next are the permitting and inspection checklists on the left and right, respectively. These examples are from the EVSE single family guides. They are designed to be concise, to be easy to use in the office and the field. The permitting checklist includes a summary of technical requirements from applicable codes detailed in the installation guide for designers and users. The inspection checklist includes key criteria to inspect and verify from applicable codes detailed in the installation guide and submission requirements for AHJs and inspectors, and the numbers correspond. Um, where they're numbered, it corresponds between the um, permitting, the plan review checklist, and the inspection checklist. Next slide. Each guide includes application pages, which can be used as is or used as a model. And um, on our uh, the link provided in our website, there's sets of the guides available with and without the application pages in some jurisdictions. Um, if they have a different application process, wouldn't need the sample application pages. Um, and so if, if there's a concern about that causing confusion for your audiences, there's sets available without the application pages. Next slide. An additional document was developed to support adoption of the guides, which is the permitting process guide. It outlines who should use the guides, how to use them, and best practices and lessons learned for successful implementation of a new permitting and inspection system. Next slide. With that, I'd like to walk you through some of the key lessons learned for successful implementation of new permitting and inspection processes. Our three keys are communication, coordination, and education. Next slide. Communicate with your utility. If you anticipate an uptick in adoption in your area, let your utility company know. Some localities have experienced bottlenecks on the interconnection side due to increased demand when distributed energy resource permitting is streamlined. When planning to implement a new or streamlined um, distributed energy permitting process, communicate ahead of time with your utility to let them know the geographic areas where increased electric connectivity may be expected. Continue to provide them with updates over time as your um, streamlined process expands to other areas. Next slide. Coordinate with other departments. The installation of these systems may be subject to local zoning and permitting requirements from other departments besides building. So in your planning process, um, planning to implement a new process, consider that you will need to establish which departments will review the permit application and issue final approval. Leadership from any departments involved will need to come together to, um, in advance to agree on any new process with the goal in mind of establishing a simplified permit process. Coordinate with your fire services. Uh, invite them to review any new requirements and process together. You may need to agree on any changes um, any necessary changes to the interdepartmental workflow. Next slide. Educate responsible parties. You will surely need to make appropriate updates and trainings available um, to your plan review and field inspection staff. Um, I think that I'm gonna get into that a little bit more in a minute. Um, and it's, it's also good to have similar, uh, a similar introduction available to fire service staff, and it's nice to have a training and resources available to installers in your community as well. Next slide. For education, consider which scope reviewers need to be apprised of the requirements. Remember to communicate the new process and requirements to third party plan review services. Update the technical review requirements for your jurisdiction that are referenced by any contractors or third-party services. And as you plan how any new trainings will be provided, consider how to support your staff in taking the time to train. 
slide. Where to find the guides? I think that I already uh, had the, the link provided. Uh, you can find the EVSE and solar and energy storage um, permitting and, and inspection guides, sorry, long mouthful, um, in a few places. They're on the NBI's, on NBI's website, um, also available um, at the IREC Clearinghouse, um, and that link will be shared in a minute. Next slide. So just a note, um, a note on the um, the code cycles reference, the, the electrical code cycles referenced, and in a few minutes, Brennan will get into that in more detail. Um, but this shows a map of where each code cycle is currently in effect, um, showing that the majority at this time are still, um, the majority is in 2020 um, code cycle and quite a number on 2017 code cycle. Um, and so that's why these guides are focused on those at the time, this time. Um, but I'm looking forward to hearing from Brennan on new changes in the 2023 code cycle. Next slide. Uh, before I hand it over, I just wanted to mention briefly um, that there are related uh, training or educational solutions available from some partners that we worked with over the course of the Empowered Project. Um, so the next few slides are um, um, being shown with permission from South Face, and South Face has um, a learning platform called Learn Upon, and there's the link to that as well. Um, so they've developed trainings um, on uh, clean energy, renewable energy resources uh, for a number of different audiences. Um, so just mentioning those quickly, they've got some directed to homeowners and building owners. Next slide. Um, some directed to uh, code officials specifically. Introductory code trainings, high performance buildings and solar installation. Next slide. The third audience is property managers. And again, each, um, each audience category has uh, covers each of the topics um, I mentioned a minute ago. And next slide. As well as for technicians and installers. So thank you for showing those. Um, next slide. Also um, a little bit about um, additional resources available from um, IREC, which we also which also coordinated the empowered programs. The Interstate Renewable Energy Council is um, an independent nonprofit that builds the foundation for rapid adoption of clean energy and energy efficiency uh, to benefit people, the economy, and the planet. And the, the link to their some of their well, their platform and educational solutions is in the chat. And uh, next slide. Um, just lists um, a number of related resources um, that have already that have already been shared and help support this sort of suite of solutions. Um, now, I just wanted to remark for a moment before um, before passing the floor to Brennan, um, looking ahead um, at how how these these technologies. Uh, intersect with energy codes with the IECC model code and 90.1. Um, so there's really an open question right now about how technologies such as these will be treated in energy codes. Um, you more than likely have heard about um, the, the um, process with the adoption of the new 2024 IECC. Um, and with that, I just wanted to mention a couple of themes. Um, one is um, for, for measures that will be going into the appendices as opposed to the base code, um, I would say there is there's a lot of opportunity for states and jurisdictions to adopt the appendices, of course, um, and there's a lot of opportunity related to that for code development, um, people in the code development community and advocates to assist with adoption and implementation. Um, so perhaps that's a that's a, a hopeful note uh, looking forward in um, in how requirements related to these technologies can be um, sort of brought into the picture in the near term. 
Um, and also about scope. There's, uh, there is some question about how these technologies fit into the scope of energy codes. Um, and that's there is a desire, a strong desire on the part of the code development community to clarify the scope uh, relative to these technologies in energy codes. And that's something that that will be um, that will be addressed because um, it's this is it's really an evolving landscape here. Um, so thank you. And with that, I um, would like to pass the floor to Brennan. Thank you, Amy, and thank you everyone for attending today. Um, really good presentation so far, kind of laying out, you know, some of the evolving landscape around electrification and decarbonization and some really cool um, sort of well-developed and beautiful training tools that MBI and others are, are putting out there to support this space. So super excited to see that stuff. Um, my name is Brennan Less. I'm coming from the Residential Building Systems Group at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And today I'm going to talk a bit more, um, let's say, looking to like the current version of the electrical code and looking to the future on that code for sort of the next edition um, and just some general thinking in that space around what we're starting to call sort of low power electrification. And so um, hopefully we'll have some interesting stuff to share today and get you guys involved in the uh, code process for that 2026 cycle. So next slide, please. So I just want to start with this sort of framing. You know, a lot of us are already familiar with energy, right? Energy, energy efficiency, energy bills. Um, and we're, that's what our energy codes and the IECC largely think about. Um, that's what, you know, Energy Star is based around. We're used to thinking about energy kilowatt hours, right? So on the left, we're kind of illustrating, you know, that this is sort of usage over time, right? If we've got this, you know, power trace, it's sort of like the area under that curve is the energy we're using. And that's sort of largely where the building energy codes focus. And what I'll present today is hopefully, you know, a little bit of a refocusing around thinking about power, which is kind of like the instantaneous demand, right? Or in, in that plot on the right, we're kind of showing it as the, as the maximum value, that sort of red dot at the top. And that's largely where sort of the National Electrical Code operates. Um, it's where some of the constraints we face around the distribution uh, system and the electric grid operate, right? They're sort of on the power side and not on the energy side, right? It matters what's happening at a point in time, uh, not sort of like over the course of a year, over the course of a month. So uh, starting by laying out sort of that important distinction, we'll jump to our next slide and talk about how those concepts like lead into thoughts about energy efficiency, which we're all pretty used to thinking about, I think. Uh, and then power efficiency, which is kind of this like newer concept that some of us in the industry are starting to explore and toy with and see sort of like where it has application. And so I've laid out just kind of a basic example here, hopefully to illustrate, you know, some of the differences looking at electric water heaters, right? So on the left, we might have a traditional electric resistance tank water heater, uh, you know, these things, they work great, but fairly high uh, energy use, right? Lots of kilowatt hours per year, fairly high power demand, right? Maybe four and a half to five and a half kilowatts. Um, so they're kind of on some level, energy and power inefficient, right? They're not our best options. When we move to heat pump water heaters, kind of this one in the middle, 240 volt, this is sort of the traditional heat pump water heater we're used to thinking about. Huge energy efficiency improvement, right? We we reduce our energy use, our kilowatt hours really substantially. These things are super efficient, you know, three, four times the efficiency we get out of the, the traditional tank unit. But the power rating is basically identical, right? It's still just four and a half kW. It's effectively no different than the electric resistance unit on the left, right? So we'd call that kind of power inefficient. Um, and then if we jump to the, the sort of like option on the right, there's, you know, this emerging set of solutions you might have seen on the market called 120 volt heat pump water heaters, right? And these sort of um, get to the best of both of these worlds, right? They have, they should have similar energy performance to the sort of their, their bigger cousins, the 240 volt appliances. Um, but they 
achieve power efficiency as well, right? So they're rated at maybe only one kilowatt instead of four and a half kilowatts. So we're going to, you know, think of that as sort of like an energy and a power efficient solution. And, you know, ideally we're going to, you know, move the industry and move the country in this direction, right? Of starting to think about both of these issues together because they both matter. We'll jump to our next slide. So I come from a space thinking largely about existing dwellings. And so we'll kind of start there. Um, again, I think Chris kind of already framed this up at the beginning, but we have sort of a massive electrification of US housing just starting at this point, right? We're starting to see the the the, the beginnings of that. Our, our friends over at Rewiring America kind of call this the, the one billion machines problem, right? Where they outline in that table on the right, all of the millions and millions of sort of new machines, new electrical loads that we're going to have to add to the housing units across our country. And it's pretty daunting to think of it that way. Um, most of our housing is, you know, existing dwellings. And the sort of best estimates we have right now says that about a third of those are kind of service or power constrained, right? Roughly a third have something like 100 amp panels, um, compared with, you know, really common sort of 200 amp panels in newer construction. And they might have limited breaker slots, right? So just like li literally physically fitting a new load in the breaker panel could be a real challenge. Um, you know, the sort of business as usual solution if we're trying to electrify or decarbonize these loads is to just upsize that panel, upsize the service wires. Um, and, you know, that certainly works, but it, it's expensive, and it's you know potentially time consuming, very much depending on uh, your sort of jurisdiction and the utility service. Um, really rough estimate right now is that this is something like you know over a hundred billion dollar national problem, right? And that's just for the sort of service panel side. It has nothing to do with the rest of our infrastructure woes. Um, so it's a really big price tag out there um, that we think is worth solving, right? As a, as a sort of an important constraint here and power efficiency is gonna be really important in thinking about solving it. Um, again, Chris already laid this out, but the we're, you know, in this context, you know, in addition to these constraints and decarbonization, we've got flexible utility rates, time of use pricing, the addition of renewables and storage to the system, you know, new digital controls uh, and all sorts of new things that are emerging that just make this landscape uh, increasingly complex. Um, let's jump to our next slide. So, you know, in existing dwellings, it's obvious, right? We've got this kind of constrained service capacity. It's a challenge to electrify these dwellings. We need some interesting solutions. We should think about power efficiency. Um, New construction, right? Like I think that's a lot of where the energy codes focus, frankly. And you know, the the story there is slightly less direct, right? Because in new construction, you can often just specify a larger service panel with a larger service amperage, and you can build a subdivision that has the sort of necessary grid transformers and electrical infrastructure in place to handle all the big loads that you might want to put on it. Um but we would argue that you should still consider power efficiency in this context, right? And the reason is just whether it's new construction or existing dwellings, every new load we add to the grid contributes to the need for grid infrastructure upgrades for new power generation facilities. It leads to utility staff time for doing load studies and the linemen and other workers who actually have to do those physical infrastructure upgrades. Um, that's the case for new or existing buildings, right? We all sort of have to deal with that. Um, and there can be direct impacts in, in new construction projects, right? That some of those infrastructure upgrade costs get passed directly onto homeowners or developers. So there's sort of a direct economic impact. Um, and then the other issues are to do with interconnection with the utility, right? We can run into pretty serious time delays, anywhere from months to years for those interconnections, depending on the load and sort of where you are in the grid. And then we're starting to see in some jurisdictions and in some utility territories, straight up interconnection denials, right? Where you're trying to develop a project and it, you, lots of money has been invested in the, in the planning phases or even in the construction phase, and it gets to connecting it to the utility. And that's denied at least either permanently or for an important period of time. So really big concern there. And again, I think power efficiency can play a really important role in, in addressing that. All of these things lead to indirect impacts, right? One is that 
whether you're new or an existing dwelling, the more load you add, the less load that other households can add, right? It's all kind of a zero-sum game till we have to start doing these uh, infrastructure upgrades. And then all of that, all of the above, is going to increase the utility rates that all of us are paying, right? So while there might not seem to be a direct impact, let's say, in the service panel for new dwellings, uh, all of these new loads will eventually, and the infrastructure costs and upgrades are eventually going to filter up to higher rates that all of us have to pay and, you know, potentially causing, you know, interesting uh, and unfortunate sort of equity and just general uh, economic impacts. So I think new construction, existing construction, we should be thinking about power efficiency. Let's jump to the next slide. Great. So um, yeah, this is not necessarily the main focus of the talk today, but I just want to highlight some strategies that people can, you know, think about or leave with and read about more for what they could do to do sort of power efficiency today on whatever projects they're, they're working on, right? Um, and for starters, we want to pick high efficiency equipment, right? The energy codes are already sort of encouraging us to do this. Um, we want to pick power efficient versions of those loads, right? So if we're installing HVAC heat pumps, that might mean doing what we can to avoid using backup resistance heat, right? Because that's a really big power load on the grid and in our panel. Um, we might want to think about the same thing for water heaters, right? We already laid out the case that you can have a heat pump water heater that also has big electric elements in it, not very power efficient, or we can use these sort of emerging alternative versions. And similar things exist um, when we look at clothes drying or, or cooking type solutions. So we want to pick those power efficient, low power appliances. Um, you know, oversizing is our enemy here, right? Whether it's the the power level of our electric vehicle chargers, or whether it's the heating capacity of our heat pump, we want to avoid oversizing because all of those things are going to help us make space in our electric panels and on the grid. Um, Multi-function devices, right? So these are kind of like combination appliances. A lot of people already have this, right? Think about your cooking range. It combines a cooktop and an oven together. Um, but some homes have separate appliances, right? And those can add to the sort of load on the house sort of very differently, potentially. Um, and then other sort of like more emerging newer solutions are looking like combination washer dryers, right? So this is instead of a separate washer dryer, we now have one appliance. You put the clothes in, they get washed, they get dried, you take them out, right? Very interesting. They tend to be lower power and they take up less space in the panel. Again, more of a existing home issue, but still worth thinking about for newer homes uh, and in multifamily where we're super uh, floor area constrained. Um, we can start thinking about load controls. There's interesting sort of circuit sharing devices where we can kind of wire two loads together onto one circuit and make sure that only one operates at a time. Super traditional approach here would be like a clothes dryer and an EV charger. Just pause the EV charger when the dryer is operating and otherwise things work normally. Um, we can use sort of like load control circuit pausing devices, smart panels, those range anywhere from, you know, individual circuits all the way up to the whole panel. And then in general, again, the energy codes are already doing a really good job of helping us decrease our loads, right? Improving envelope, uh, using ductless equipment, efficient fixtures. These are the ideas we wanna go with and think about implementing across all of our projects to achieve sort of power efficiency. Let's jump to our next slide. So again, the previous speakers have laid this out a little bit, but we want to think about building energy codes versus electrical codes. You know, like where do they relate? Um, people can feel free to disagree with this framing, but I sort of think about the energy codes as telling us, you know, what loads must we install? What must their efficiency be? It might tell us about the electrification that we have to do or pre-wiring or sizing mandates that we need to follow. And then the electrical code says, okay, given that list of things that we need to do, here's what you have to do to install it safely and size your infrastructure for those loads, right? So that's things like the circuit requirements or how do we do electrical load calculations? How do we size our conductors or our circuit breakers? Uh, and how do we label this equipment so we ensure electrical safety? And then finally, there's the National Electrical Safety Code. I won't really go into this in any more detail today. Needless to say, it's kind of like the NEC, but at the grid level, right? So it's sort of a corresponding um, 
look at how distribution infrastructure is safely sized. Let's jump to our next slide. So without further ado, the National Electrical Code, we've already been talking about it today. Um, to be clear, it's not quite a code, right? It's actually a standard, right? So it's an NFPA standard, the National Fire Protection Association, standard number 70. Um, and then it addresses primarily electrical hazards and you guessed it, fire safety, right? It's right there in the name of NFPA. Um, it's not a decarbonization code, right? It's not an efficiency code. Nothing in this code is trying to encourage more efficient equipment. It's not trying to encourage fuel switching or decarbonization activities of any kind, right? Again, its primary focus is on electrical hazards, fire safety, and you know, making sure that installation requirements are met that, that meet those constraints. Um, and again, we don't have a national building code. We don't really have a, you know, on some level, a national electrical code. This one, you know, it takes that place, but it, it ends up getting adopted and enforced by local jurisdictions, most often at the state level, sometimes individual counties or munici uh, municipalities. Amy already showed this map from the NFPA website. Thanks to them for putting this out. This is the most recent update as of something like March 2024, I think. So pretty recent map. Most states are currently using the 2020 NEC, uh, which is a good thing based on uh, all those NBI guidelines using that, that code version. And then we got kind of equal numbers using the, the previous cycle, the 2017 NEC, and then some states you know, are chomping at the bit and they're already using the 2023 code. Um, very exciting stuff. A couple are using the 2008 code. I'm not exactly sure what's going on uh, in those states, but apparently that code's working for them. Um, let's jump to the next slide. So you too can access the National Electrical Code for free. Just go to the NFPA website um, and let's jump to the next slide. Uh, you can go to this kind of, whoops, <laughs> go to the sort of current prior editions down there and then you can cycle back through all the editions and view free access. I think you need to sign up and have sort of a user account, but it's free. And you too can look at the entire code uh, on a page by page basis. So it's a little um, difficult to, to sort through, but just good to know that you can access this code for free, including the current edition and past editions at the NFPA website. Alternatively, you can purchase you know, paper or whole digital copies uh, if you're interested. So let's jump to our next slide. So. Thinking about building energy codes and about some of the requirements in there, what parts of the NEC are kind of relevant? Just provide like a little summary here as I see it. I might be missing some sections. Uh, feel free to call that out in the Q&A. Um, first, our load calculations. That's sort of like the, the sizing of our electric infrastructure to, to meet whatever's installed. That's in section 220. We've got electric vehicle power transfer systems in article 625. We've got solar PV systems in Article 690, interconnected electric power production sources and energy storage systems in 705 and 706, and then finally energy management systems in Article 750. So again, at a high level, I see these as kind of like the most relevant sections that folks should be thinking about um, in relation to you know, some of what we see coming from home decarbonization efforts and from you know requirements in the building energy codes. Uh, next slide, please. Just to quickly highlight that today's focus from me, because this is where my expertise largely lies, is in the load calculations section. I won't be touching too much on these other sections. So let's jump to the next slide. So now we know what's kind of relevant. Um, I wanted to highlight, because again, the, you know, Amy's NBI resources, those are for the 2020 code, but we now have a new code that's out, right? The 2023 NEC is available. It's in force in roughly nine states. So what's changed? This is not a total summary of all changes between 2020 and 2023, but it gives us, you know, a nice little flavor. Um, the, there are sort of, there's a new EVSE, electric vehicle uh, supply equipment provision in the load calculations for the NEC. And that basically says that you have to use the larger of either 7.2 kilowatts or the nameplate rating of your equipment. Um, unfortunately, that means if you're installing smaller equipment, like a low power level two charger, they're still asking you to treat it as a 7.2 kW charger. So that's uh, something of a concern. 
Um, we have a new provision that addresses energy management systems uh, in load calculations. That's section 220.70. And again, this basically, you know, it boils down to saying that you can use the current set point of the EMS in your load calculations and that more or less that's limited to 80% of the panel rating or the, or, or the protective rating for whatever circuits are being controlled. Um, we have a sort of revision to the metering data method. So in the code, I'll talk about it in a few minutes, but there's a way of using uh, sort of smart meter data to, to figure out what your load is. And there's a little change there, which addresses homes that have PV systems or demand response systems. So that's worth being aware of. Um, we also have a revision to the EVSE ratings in 625.42. Uh, kind of explicitly letting us uh, derate those appliances based on whether we're using an energy management system or some of our EVSE have adjustable settings, right, where uh, you could set it to a lower value and then sort of take credit for that in the electrical code. And then finally, there's some additions to the to the whole energy management system section uh, in 750, and that sort of adds a listing requirement and also adds a bunch of details around labeling requirements and what these systems have to do if they're in a malfunctioning state and how we might protect users from tampering with those systems, right? If we're sort of relying on a system to protect a circuit, we can't just have the user be able to click something and turn it off very easily. So those are like some of the changes uh, in the current iteration of the code relative to 2020. Let's jump forward. So load calculations in dwellings, again, kind of focused on existing dwellings. There's two main ways. Both of these are kind of optional paths within the code. And the first is 220.83. Um, it's basically going around doing an inventory of the loads in the house, adding them up, and then applying an adjustment factor for the, for the fact that they're not all operating at the same time. Um, see this as kind of an asset rating, right? It wouldn't depend on who's living in the home or anything. It's not going to change from year to year. Um, it usually gives kind of a larger load, but it has a little bit more flexibility in how we add new loads, right? So when you're using this code path, a lot of new loads get treated at 40% of their rated power. So you could potentially add, you know, more than double uh, the load because of that 40% allowance. Uh, for that reason, it might be a better option when you're trying to add lots of new loads to an existing home instead of just maybe one. Um, it does require that you go around and inspect and record all the nameplate values in the home. So it's kind of burdensome in that way. And we'll highlight that there are very, very similar corresponding sections for new dwellings in 22082. Those are used in almost all new housing development calculations and in multifamily dwellings in 22084. Um, the second option is sort of a uh, metering-based method, 22087, gives us kind of an operational load calculation, right? So in this case, it's based on actual metered consumption for, uh, for a service or feeder. And, you know, in that case, it's, you know, it, if different people were living in the home, you might get sort of a different answer, right? Because of their behavior and their power using uh, behaviors. Um, you also might get slightly different answers from year to year, right? Where we see, you know, the the observed load might be a little bit higher one year or lower the next year for weather reasons or uh, all sorts of reasons. So that's worth knowing. And there we they sort of take the maximum demand, add twenty five percent, and then you can add new loads to that based just on their nameplate rating, right? So there's no sort of forty percent adjustment; it just sort of gets added directly. Um, this approach usually gives us smaller loads, but then lets us add less new load, right? Because um, we're treating it at 100% instead of 40%. Um, this might be the best option if you're just trying to add one or two loads, or if you're adding loads over time, you can kind of iteratively do this calculation um, and might be able to fit sort of more loads on that panel safely. Um, What's exciting about this is that it's potentially automated and scalable to the millions using smart meter infrastructure, right? So that's sort of why we're interested in it is because it potentially gives the ability to do, you know, scaled, automated, low cost, accurate load calculations across the housing stock, at least in regions where we have uh, AMI uh, metering installed. Let's jump to our next slide. Um, this is just giving like a quick illustration of the calculation. You might have metering data. Let's say you had a peak demand of four kilowatts. 
you multiply that by 1.25, that gives you five kilowatts. And if you had a 100 amp panel that has a 24 kilowatt rating at 240 volts, subtract those two, you can add 19 kilowatts of new loads, right? So you can add a, a new cooking range or an HVAC heat pump, lots of capacity there. So that's sort of how that code section works. Let's jump to the next slide. And then the alternative is this sort of bottom-up uh, nameplate rating, 22083. And this looks more like a spreadsheet, right? You're going to kind of tabulate the loads that are in the home, add them up, apply an adjustment factor, and you get your, your load at the end. Um, so two very different approaches. Again, this one gives kind of an asset rating. The previous gives more of an operational rating. Um, let's jump to our next slide. The loads that matter most, uh, you know, it depends, but the the sort of rated power of these kinds of loads does vary a lot. So EVSE can be really huge, right? In a lot of cases, we start seeing like 12 kilowatt EVSE chargers put in place. Um, resistant space heating or uh, tankless electric water heating can be really big. Those can be anywhere in the five to 20 kW range. Um, 20 kW is almost the entire capacity of a 100 amp panel, right? Let's just remember that. So that's almost the whole thing. Um, cooking can vary, but most electric ranges we're installing are in that sort of 12 kW range. So again, really big power rating. Um, HVAC heat pumps can be a lot lower depending on the size. Uh, this very much depends on the tonnage, the, the heating capacity of the equipment, but can be anywhere between sort of three and 10 kW. And then we get sort of lower numbers uh, for clothes drying and water heaters, both typically in that sort of like four to six kilowatt kind of realm. But this gives kind of like a rough uh, sequencing. Let's jump to our next slide. Great, so we're looking to the future, right? So there's all this great power efficiency stuff. There's the current provisions and allowances in the code, but we wanna think to the future. Like, are there ways that we can make the electrical code a little bit friendlier to home decarbonization, right? So that we can engage in fewer panel and service upgrades, fewer grid infrastructure upgrades, um, and still do the decarbonization work we're trying to do. So we're part of sort of a, a DOE and national lab team that are investigating, you know, how can we make this better in the US housing stock? And we're sort of part of an industry coalition also led by Build It Green, again, looking to the next code cycle. So let's jump ahead. Um, we basically have reviewed the current code, try to figure out what barriers there are to dwelling electrification. We've analyzed a lot of metering data to try to understand better how power actually gets used in homes. And more recently, we submitted a lot of public inputs to the NFPA for their 2026 code cycle. And we've been engaging in some NFPA task groups and code making panel meetings. We want these load calculations to be clear and safe and to support home electrification, right? We don't want to cause additional hazards, right? We want these to remain safe codes while also being sort of friendlier and more um, permissive towards home electrification. Uh, we think some of the assumptions should be based on actual performance in dwellings. We want accurate scalable load calculations using the smart meters. Uh, and we want this to apply sort of, you know, across the, the load calculation sections in the code. Let's jump ahead. Um, so I'm probably going to run out of time with these slides. So I'm going to race ahead. But just to say, we used a lot of data to think about this problem. Uh, we've got whole dwelling demand data, just sort of like maximum peak demand data from something like 12,000 U.S. homes, multiple years of data from those homes. We have end use sub metering data. So, you know, actual like circuit by circuit, 15 minute measurements in about a thousand US dwellings. Again, multiple years of data. Uh, all of this is being leveraged to sort of these uh, efforts to update the code with some values that are lined up with what actually happens in homes. So let's jump to the next slide. High level learnings, just thinking about electrical service and feeders and homes. We found that just most dwellings have lots of capacity for new loads. Um, the plot on the right sort of shows the distribution of peak demand for these homes that we have. Typically, they use nine kilowatts. That's less than half of a 100 amp panel, which is shown in that yellow line. Uh, massively less than a 200 amp panel, which is shown in that red line. And we see that almost no homes, like 98% of homes use less than 100 amps. 99.8% use less than 200 amps. 
most homes just have a lot of spare capacity. Um, we find that when we add new loads to homes, they don't add at their nameplate rating, right? So we can add them substantially less than that. Um, we find that there's lots of load diversity. So all of the loads are not on at the same time, right? We don't need a, an electrical code that says everything is on at the same time, add it together. We can account for that diversity. Um, and we find that, you know, effectively never does it occur that more than four loads are at 100% at the same time. So again, all this is saying that we've got uh, opportunities to account for diversity and for treating loads at less than 100%. Um, let's, we're running out of time. Let's skip the next two slides if we can. They're interesting, but we'll jump past that. Okay, so the NEC revision. Again, we're engaged in this process. It's on a three-year cycle. So again, the current edition is 2023. The next one will be 2026. And as we already learned, that will then get adopted in the states over time. We won't you know, immediately see it go into effect. Um, the NFPA follows, I believe, sort of a standard kind of ANSI accreditation process for creating standards. There's public inputs. Code-making panels uh, sort of address those public inputs. They issue a first draft. There's then a public comment period. The code making panel engages with it again. They issue a second and sort of near final draft. And then we get to the point where our new standard is published. And right now we're at the place between uh, the public inputs and the first draft being issued. So that's where we are right now. Let's jump ahead. So ideas that we put out there for the 2026 code and seem like they have some support they're not finalized or approved, but these are things that are, you know, have at least some good chance of passing, is reducing general lights and receptacle loads from three to two watts per square foot. Um, we might see a reduction in sort of baseline power associated with new dwelling units from 10 to 8 kVA. Um, we're hoping for existing dwellings to sort of remove the current uh, different treatment of new HVAC versus other loads and trying to just treat new HVAC as if it was any other load. Uh, instead of adding it at 100%, we would add it at something like 50%. Um, we've got you know specific treatment for EVSE, uh, new provisions for power control systems. There's gonna be a lot of changing going on between energy management systems and power control systems. So there's this is sort of an, an emerging and evolving landscape there in terms of like what sort of load controls we're able to use. Um, and then again, over, hopefully overall expanding the ability to take credit for those load controls in our load calculations. We still need help with uh, reworking the metering data method to 2087. We're trying to make that friendlier to electrification. Um, and then trying to get sort of reduced assumptions around heat pumps throughout the code and generally trying to get the code to let you use nameplate ratings rather than default values. Again, I talked about the EVSE where you're forced to think about it as a seven kilowatt load instead of what you're actually installing, which might be less than that. So let's jump ahead. <laughs> Great. So. If you're interested in those, like getting engaged on the metering data methods or seeing what's actually making it into the first draft of the code, uh, you should pay attention, right? Go July 10th, we're expecting the first draft of the 2026 code to be issued. And then there's gonna be a public comment period that ends August 28th. And if you have suggestions or revisions to the code language that shows up in that first draft, that's your opportunity to do it. Um, if you want to engage with us as part of that process, you know, reach out to me after this webinar. Um, glad to see it. And then, you know, eventually we'll see the the second draft and the final issuing uh, in March of 2025 of the updated 2026 code. But be paying attention this summer. That's when the first draft comes out, and this is sort of the last opportunity to uh, put in public comments and have those be heard by the code making panels. Let's jump ahead. Uh, if you want to submit public comments, it's back to that NFPA website, um, and we'll click, uh, let's advance one more. We go to that sort of next edition, and you can view public input online, and there's a whole sort of system for engaging with the code and making public comments uh, that you can follow there. Um, let's jump to our next slide. Um, things that on the horizon that aren't quite in the NEC yet, but are you know important are, um, Things like DC microgrids, uh, digital load controls, um, battery integrated appliances, 
Um, when you think about energy storage systems, it's really not clear how those get treated in load calculations. Um, so th there's a lot of sort of um, big questions out there. Maybe that'll be for the 2029 code cycle. Um, let's jump to the next slide. Um, I'm gonna skip this one because I think we're running out of time. And I'll just highlight a few other resources, right? We've been talking about power efficiency, how it's good in new and existing dwellings, how we wanna get it sort of more into the electrical code. Some good resources here for power efficiency, Redwood Energy, they've got some great pocket guides and a watt diet calculator to help people sort of achieve power efficient design. Um, Rewiring America has some solid planning tools around electrification planning and panel planning. Um, and finally, some of these sort of load controls and these new solutions available have been reviewed in this CalNext study uh, that I think was written by our friends at the Vermont Energy Investment Corporation. So I just want to give a plug for all these resources. Um, let's jump to our next slide. I'll just say thanks for your attention and looking forward to the Q&A. Uh, again, if you're interested in engaging with this process, uh, let me know. My email is right here and looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Brennan. Thank you, Amy. Um, both really great presentations, lots of information packed in there. Um, we've been getting a ton of questions. Uh, this is, we may be setting records for the number of questions we've gotten in one of these webinars. So I'm really excited. Um, I think we can get through in the uh, 17 minutes that we have left um, a decent number of these. So uh, let's, let's dive into them. Um, the first few here are going to be hopefully fairly quick clarifying ones. And then we have some that I think are, you know, we'll take a little bit more time to be thoughtful about answering. Um, so first one, a uh, question for you, Brennan, this is an EV question. Um, it, so at some point, I think partway through your, your presentation, there's a question, um, were, you, were you essentially unsuccessful in um, the effort to get 220.57 revised to require load to match nameplate for a completed EV circuit? Yeah, right. So this is one of the public inputs we put in is just saying, hey, you could use, you know, the nameplate rating or 7.2 kW. Um, and, you know, I was not expecting that to be controversial, but there was very strong pushback within the code making panels around that seems to be a lot of concern uh, throughout the code in these contexts of what people will do in the future and what we're designing our systems to be able to accommodate and the notion that a homeowner might want that greater capacity. Um, and the EVSE was, in particular is seen as a place where loads are growing and growing and not getting less and less. That was sort of a distinction between, let's say electric vehicles and clothes drying. Um, that said, we're probably gonna put a public comment in trying to fight for this again uh, this summer, but I, uh, it didn't seem like the kind of uh, issue where like more information or data was going to change the minds of the members of the code making panel. It was sort of a philosophical issue around like, well, we have to provide for the future on this, uh, even if you're putting in something smaller today. So personally, that was a disappointment. Um, that said, how you need to account for that uh, in things like the optional load calculations, not totally clear, right? If you're doing an existing dwelling load, it's not obvious that you need to use that, right? You very well might be able to use the nameplate rating of the equipment rather than that default. Like the the all those code sections aren't necessarily interchangeable and it doesn't always mean that one section applies to another section. So that's all yeah. still out there. So thanks for the question. Yep, yeah, uh, that was a good one. And um, that's just kind of how codes go. If you uh, if your proposal doesn't pass, you bring it back and, you know, maybe maybe refine a bit and talk to some folks and see if you can get it through again. So uh, similar for energy and electrical and all the rest. Um, yep. Amy, a couple of clarifying questions for you. I think you may have already answered one of these in the chat, but uh, I'll, I'll ask them both for everybody's um, benefit anyway. Um, does the, the NBI guides uh, for EVSE address all cases, residential, small commercial, public versus private sector building, all of those situations? Um, yes, I, I, yeah, I answered that in the chat. Um, the, sh the short answer, general answer is yes, it covers residential, single family, duplex, multifamily, as well as commercial, any size. Um, but some, I would note that there might be special requirements, you know, other, other compliance requirements for special building types like schools and hospitals. They might be under another jurisdiction or requirement. Yep. Yeah, that, that makes sense. 
And then um, a related question on the guides, but this one is geared uh, also geared towards EVs. Um, do, the, do the guides include low power level two? So that's um, like 20 amp, you know, lower lower power, 240 volt options. Um, yes, yes, that's addressed. Great. Okay, good, good to know. Um, so here's a question in this, I think, Brendan, maybe more for you, but Amy, I think feel free to weigh in as well. Um, so this is more from like a utility perspective. So uh, the question is, our, our power company will often claim a one to three year uh, delay to upgrade local transformers. Um, this is based on peak load calculations without any regard to load, mm -hmm. load management systems um, that could be proposed. So what could be done here to integrate load, man load management into the entire picture? And Brennan, you talked about this a bit during your presentation, but I think maybe it's, and now it's answering this through the lens of how like a utility um, you know, operates and plans for their transformer upgrades. Yeah, right. I mean, the, you know, standard practice is if you're adding a new load to a dwelling, uh, it should be reported to the serving utility. And often that looks like you tell them the the rating of the load being added. So one solution there is obviously to use those low power appliances, right? So if you're reporting adding a smaller load versus a larger load, uh, that's less likely to, to sort of cause congestion on those distribution circuits. Um, I would say it's an area of future interest for us uh, as to like digging into how utilities think about sizing these systems and what they sort of do with that information that they receive from customers. Uh, you know, the few instances I've heard of, they just add it right to their load that they already have. So they assume that things sort of add at 100%. Uh, if our work in dwellings, uh, you know, carries up to the grid level, that's probably a bad assumption, right? And almost all these loads add it well under their rated value. So I see that as a, you know, a space for us to explore in the future. Um, yeah, the load controls, that's like a whole other issue. And again, it's it's like an area, future topic for us. Um, we're not like as deep on the utility side of this yet, but we're heading in that direction. Great. Appreciate that. Um, we're gonna switch gears to one that I, I thought, so this is a two-part question. And I, I think um, Amy and Brennan, this, this could apply to both of you. Um, so the first part of the question is, uh, many workforce training, apprenticeship, or journeyman education programs are still using old versions of the code um, and states may be lagging in adoption of newer codes um, like NEC 2017. I think that's a reference to an older version of NEC. Um, so is, is there some sort of resource that explains the differences uh, from these older codes that are addressed in newer codes and specifically when you're looking at um, electric ready and Z and E, you know, and I, I can just say for energy codes, um, I don't think there's really a centralized resource, you know, like a table that's comparing the requirements of each, but there are um, reports and, and presentations you can look through that show, okay, you know, here is what was added, you know, in the 2021 IECC and that's how you know, that's how this is different from the 2018 version. Um, but it, I know for myself, it, it it often requires a little bit of digging and it would be nice to have a resource like that for the energy code, but it, maybe that's different for electrical code. Um, um, yes, so I think, yeah, it would be great to to have a, a resource that that compares side, side by side. <laughs> yeah, I also don't, um, I'm not aware of one. Um, I think I would say generally, and um, I don't know how useful it is exactly, um, but that the the general the general requirements, um, the general concept and process remains the same um, for the most part. So I, I think that some, sometimes um, the guidelines can be can be referenced with the note that you need to, of course, cross reference with local requirements uh, where they differ. Yeah, I think it would be super great to just create that comparison. I obviously highlighted some examples just in those slides that we were just looking at, but that's nothing like a comprehensive summary of everything that's changed. Um, so yeah, I think that's a great idea and uh, we'll put some thought to it. Okay. Sounds like something the federal government could be doing potentially here. Um, and then, so the second part of this question is how, how can we ensure that apprentices, like apprenticeship programs, workforce trainees, 
are being prepared for this all electric future, as well as the, the decarbonization, you know, that we we've been talking about here. So that's a much broader question. Um, but curious what you both think about about that one. Yeah, I mean it's a good question. Sorry, go ahead, Brennan. Yeah, it's fine. Uh it just it's a huge challenge. It applies to absolutely every part of this transition that we're trying to do, right? Whether it's like workforce at the utility scale or in households or, you know, wherever. Uh it's a huge challenge. Uh, you know, I think like to whatever extent we can, we need just great resources like what MBI has put together that just like make these things as clear as possible and walk people through the process um, without having to spend months and months becoming, you know, soup to nuts experts. Like we need these tools and tools like that that apply to the load calculations or to power efficiency and all these other kinds of solutions. So, yeah. And, and uh, I would also say for apprentices and trainees to ask their instructors for instruction in these, uh, in these technologies or uh, the latest requirements. And hopefully, um, you know, the um, instruction will follow suit um, or it can be pointed to local resources that are relevant. Yep, yeah, I think those are, both, those are both good responses. Um, I'm going to go to a couple EV specific questions. We got we have wide range, but uh, quite a few EV questions here. So I'm going to sprinkle them in throughout. Um, so Amy, I think this one may be directed towards you. So are, are there citing standards for EV charging in enclosed garages due to the fire risk concerns? Uh, there are, and that's covered in the guides. And is it okay if I share screen for a moment? Yeah. Um, Just to show it, because I've got it right here. Do you see, okay, I think you see this. Um, yeah, so there's, yeah, the guides, the guides list uh, four strategies for siting to avoid uh, impact and related hazards. So two are with physical barriers, wheel barriers or bollards. Um, and one option is uh, site it um, at a height um, of four feet or higher or on the side wall. Um, so these are all options. It's not that any one of these strategies in particular is suggested to be required. Thanks. Great. Um, glad to know that that's part of the resource. Um, I'm going to take one on EV. So uh, the question is, does EV technically add to the load of a building? How is DOE encouraging incorporating EV charging into zero energy buildings? Um, I think it's a great question. You know, if you... Uh, you know, are taking a very strict interpretation of the definition of EV buildings. I mean, it's not wrong. Um, you know, they do add load, but I, I think we at DOE we we try and look, um, you know, as buildings as part of a larger system. So they, you know, might increase electrical load at the building level, but that's really only part of the story. They're going to reduce emissions overall. Um, you know, I think once vehicle to grid, um, you know, it is. Uh, something that we see that's more commonplace. I mean, it's there's also going to be load shifting and you know grid stability benefits. Um, and I think part of it too for us is is the trends that we're seeing, you know, as far as adoption of EVs, this is really already happening. You know, people want them. Um, and we think it makes sense, at least when you're constructing a new building, uh, maybe you don't place an EV charger, you know, in that building, but if you can make it EV ready, you know, have some of the pre-wiring, the conduit in there. Um, you can really lower that initial cost um, for the homeowner because it, if if they have to do a retrofit later, uh, it it costs a lot of money to do that. And you know, there's also the additional permit. Somebody um, made a a comment in the North of the chatter, the Q and A about you know the additional seven hundred dollars for a permit. Um, it, you know, that can just be a huge burden on the homeowner. So um, so we see a lot of benefits, uh, you know, of, of EV charging infrastructure, whether it's you know EV installed or EV ready. Um, so I don't know if there's anything, Brennan or Amy, you want to add to that, but that's generally how we we are viewing it. Um, okay, kind of an interesting one here, and I'm curious if you know about this technology at all. So this is, there are a couple of questions um, from the same person on balcony and plug-in solar. Um, so the question was, can you share progress on balcony solar? Um, and then also uh, progress on what is termed as plug-in solar she uses PV panels feeding an RSD enabled inverter. It's a description of what it is. 
I, I'm not I'm not that familiar with plug-in solar, but I know balcony solar is something that is uh, more commonly seen in like Germany and parts of Europe, where you know basically um, the the Nash, the electric code there enables um, enables users to to you know basically put solar panels out on their balcony and uh, you know plug it into their wall and um, you know generate electricity that way. And I I don't think that our electrical code is structured. Uh, for that, I know that our solar energy technology office only very recently reached out to us about it and wanted to chat. And I know that they're interested in looking into it, but I think this is kind of like a long scale um, change that would be needed in the electrical code. And Brennan, I'm sure you can add a lot more to that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just quickly, like, you know, if you're interconnecting a PV system through the traditional means, like there's requirements for disconnection and largely those are to protect, you know, upstream line workers, uh, you know, during power outages and stuff like that. They want to be able to ensure that there's not, uh, you know, current being uh, drawn through those circuits. And so, the same thing applies to these smaller systems that might just like plug in and use the home's wires like they still have that risk to sort of line workers upstream. And yeah, I think uh, it's an area of development and it applies, you know, way beyond solar. Like we're starting to see these sort of like battery integrated appliances that can, let's say it's a, a cooking range that has several kilowatt hours of battery in it that lets it use, you know, a regular 120 volt plug rather than a 240 volt if those could also feed power back into the grid or into the household that would be tremendously valuable right it would like increase their 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 use case you know hugely but currently we can't do that for the sort of same reason that you can't currently just plug a solar system into the into the house um so it's an area that we are thinking on and uh trying to sort of like understand the the standards and codes uh landscape and you know just just starting to explore that space. I know there are products emerging that are going to be like ready to do this, but I don't know that they'll be able to be used, you know, legally at least in at least in the United States. Yeah, that that makes sense. Um, Corey, do we have a little? Do we need a little time to wrap up at the end? I have maybe half a dozen more questions that I would love to get to, but I, we're not going to be able to get to all of them. And I know you might have some. Um, good. Yeah, you can place. ask one more question out. I just need 10 seconds at the end, no problem. All right, great. So let's see. The next one that I had on my list is um, about DC and microgrids. So what role, um, in DC being a direct current, what role did the panel, does the panel see for direct uh, current city block scale microgrids, DC nanogrids, DC appliances in a, a decarbonized grid um, scenario? And uh, not my area of expertise, so I'm going to see if our panelists have any thoughts on this. Um, I was just going to say it's a it's a good question. It's a great idea, and I think that it, it, there is uh, coming to be more attention in that area now. Um, yeah, there's there's attention attention to it and projects to develop. Um, definitely uh, microgrid technology and solutions. Uh, Brennan mentioned it. I don't know if he has more. To add on that subject not not really just yeah yeah amy's right it's like an area of expansion right now it is an opportunity maybe for those sort of direct solar type plug-in applications right where you've like genuinely isolated a dc circuit from the from the rest of the system like that's you know i think one of the use cases there but yeah it's um <laughs> Right now, I have a hard time envisioning it as like a scaled solution that dramatically changes what's going on in the housing market. But um, again, it's looking to the future. So definitely an uh, area of interest we're watching. Great. And with that, we are one minute over. So Corey, I'm going to turn it back to you. But uh, first, I want to say, uh, Amy and Brennan, really, thank you so much for joining this panel. Um, really, really enjoyed it. Love to do a follow-up, you know, at some point. Yeah, thank thanks, you. everybody.